Welcome everyone. My name is Nancy Howell. I am one of the board members with Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And I see some new names as well as some familiar names that are joining us this evening. And we're going to have a, a great program and I, I really look forward to it. Uh, so, yeah, today, believe it or not, Tuesday, August 3rd, where did the 1st and the 2nd of August go? It's just unbelievable. Uh, if we could have the next slide, please, Betsy. That's me. And how about the next one, please? Alrighty, again, uh, welcome. And uh, let's uh, have those bird quiz answers. I don't know if anybody jotted some things down. Um, and let's go to the next slide, some of the answers there. So, if you touch a bird's nest, the bird will smell your scent and abandon the nest. Did you put down true or false? Hmm. Hmm. Well, the answer really is false. Most birds have a poor sense of smell. So it's not so much the scent, your scent, that may cause a bird to abandon the nest. Uh, sometimes just by being close to or disturbing a nest, depending at what stage that nest is being built, if it's just in the construction process or egg laying or maybe just incubation is beginning to happen, birds will sometimes abandon that nest because now they know something which they figure might be a predator knows where the nest is. Now, speaking of predators, mammals, things like raccoons and squirrels, chipmunks, they will pick up on human scent and sometimes will uh, follow human scents to where a nest may be and maybe cause it to be destroyed or uh, predated and then, of course, abandoned. So, so really, again, don't worry about your sense of smell causing the birds to abandon. The, your, the sense that, or the, the smell that might be laid down might cause other animals to find the nest. Second question, can you list some species of birds that nest in Ohio whose common names have a man-made structure or building as part of their name? I gave you one, house sparrow. How many of you got down uh, chimney swift? Yay, good. How about barn owl? No, okay. How about barn swallow? House wren? Yay, I see some hands up. How about house finch? And were there any others? Did I miss some? You can either unmute and let me know, or remember, this is Ohio nesters now. I think we pretty much hit them. So, yeah, it's just kind of a fun thing to think about. Next slide, please, Betsy. Now, great crested flycatchers often incorporate one of these items as part of their nest. And I gave you four choices. Uh, it certainly is not donkey hair. I don't know how many donkeys there might be around. Uh, but shed snake skins are often incorporated. And uh, if they cannot find a dried or a, a shed snake skin, then they will sometimes use plastic or cellophane or even dried onion skins. Um, and Betsy, if you could go to the next slide, I found a photo of a, of a, a great crested flycatcher nest, and I put the arrow on the shed snake skin. As you see, it's not very much. Oh, and it looks like, wait, wait, is that donkey hair in there? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. But you can see, uh, great crested flycatchers, by the way, are a flycatcher that nests in cavities. They don't build the cavities themselves, but uh, they will utilize a cavity made by a, a woodpecker or maybe opened up a little bit more by a, a, a squirrel, something like that. So, so that's a kind of a cool thing to add to a nest, a shed snake skin. All right, so let's go back to the... Uh, question slide. All right. Now, ruby-throated hummingbirds and blue-gray gnatcatchers, two birds that do nest in Ohio, uh, they use this uh, a natural material in helping them to camouflage their nests. And I don't know if anybody got it, 
And the answer is lichens. So Betsy, let's go on to two slides down. There you go. So on the left are two mostly grown young hummingbirds, and their nest is covered with kind of this gray-green colored lichen, those little crusty parts. Uh, oh, by the way, they use a lot of spider webs in their nest, and that nest does stretch because those kiddos, uh, as they get bigger, they're, they're like, mom, mom, the nest has to get a little bit bigger. Uh, on the right is a uh, blue-gray gnat catcher, and her nest, uh, again, is covered more with what you see as a, like a light gray, almost whitish color uh, lichen. So, I mean, boy, I will tell you, somebody showed me a, a hummingbird nest not too long ago, and, well, at least they pointed me in the direction, and did I find it? No, because it was so well camouflaged. I mean, it just looked like a bump on a stick. It was amazing. So, so that's pretty, some cool things about some nests. So I like that. All righty. Let's see. Let's move along, see what we have next. Okay, it's membership renewal time. So if you're currently a member, uh, or you might have a friend who is, might be interested in becoming a member, this is the time to join. Our membership year runs from September 1st through August 31st. So it's not quite September yet, so join now. And you can see the memberships do start at $20 for those who are students or maybe have a limited income and can go all the way up to $750 as a benefactor. And there's a whole range in between. And of course, you uh, can become a member and get everything uh, electronically, uh, our newsletter and updates uh, on events and, and walks and things of that sort. So we hope that you do consider becoming a member. Uh, payment may be made by PayPal or by check. And the membership link for uh, is on the WCAS website uh, for uh, membership. We can also put it in the chat. So please, please think about renewing your membership or becoming a member. Thank you. Next, please. <laughs> the Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters, or COAC, um, we'll be having its fall gathering on Saturday, October 16th at the Grange Insurance Audubon Center in Columbus. And the gathering does run from 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Western Cuyahoga and several other chapters of, uh, or Audubon chapters are members of COAC. And this uh, one is going to be a very interesting program. Uh, Ken Kaufman will be one of the main speakers. There'll be breakout sessions with questions and, and things that people will, or, or uh, chapters will be able to discuss. You know, if you have any concerns about something, maybe another chapter has answers, or it's just a good way to connect all the uh, chapters that are members of COAC, and we would like some of the chapters that are not a member of COAC to hopefully be there at that fall gathering. Uh, so the registration is open. You can go to the COAC website, which is www.counciloac.org, and it is there's a $20 cost to attend. Uh, there will be activities on Saturday, uh, a tour of the Grange uh, Insurance Audubon Center, then of course the, the uh, uh, gathering itself with the speakers and breakout sessions. After the, after the conference, then there will be some social activities and dinner for those who want to try and spend a little bit more time in Columbus. Now, you can also think about going down uh, Friday, and um, Friday they'll be you know, staying overnight, but there'll be a, a tour of Green Lawn Cemetery, uh, which is a really famous birding spot in the Columbus region. Uh, a dinner at a local Columbus restaurant, a visit to one of the Columbus's craft breweries or distilleries, and uh, please notice the transportation uh, and your first drink will be on COAC, um, and hopefully not too many more drinks, but uh, we want to make sure you get home safely. So again, consider uh, attending the Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters Fall Gathering. 
Next, please. All righty. Next is uh, Michelle, our, one of our board members, and she will be talking about all of our field trips uh, that we have planned. Michelle, all right. take it away. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? All right, thank you. Next slide, please. All right, so as you can see, I have quite a bit to cover, but I'll try to do it quickly. Um, just an update on the Christmas and July raffle, and then speaking to a bunch of our field trips and bird walks. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so the Christmas and July raffle has concluded. Congratulations to Mary Hill, our grand prize winner, and congratulations to Paula Lozano, our second prize winner. We raised $495 through this raffle for our chapter donation to the Institute of Bird Population. So thank you to all who participated. Next slide, please. All right, please join us on August 14th at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center parking lot for our second Saturday bird walk. We usually meet between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Bill Dininger, Dave Gross Kemper, and Ken Gober are our leaders for the walk. COVID restrictions have been dropped, but it is recommended to wear a mask if you are not fully vaccinated. Next slide, please. All right, so this past second Saturday took place on July 10th, and this is Bill Dininger's report. Uh, he says, we had a large group of birders for the July 2021 second Saturday of the month bird walk. 35 observers gathered together. Uh, the walk started a few minutes early with the appearance of a yellow-throated vireo singing and bouncing around several trees. The vireo gave some of us great looks. The weather was great, sunny, and in the low 70s. We ended the walk after three and a half hours of observations. 45 species were tallied by the group. Many of the expected species were observed. Highlights were as follows. Five ruby-throated hummingbirds were seen. The American Red Star teased us with brief appearances. A scarlet tanager called from high above but was never seen. An indigo bunting sat on a high branch and sang for several minutes. The best highlight was an Acadian flycatcher on a nest close to the trail and very easy to see. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so in partnership with the Tremont West Development Corporation in an effort to encourage exploration of the towpath trail in Tremont, we are hosting monthly bird walks the fourth Saturday of the month, starting at 9 a.m., meeting at the towpath public parking lot on Abbey Avenue. Uh, from here, we bird the Ohio and Erie Canal towpath trail towards Scranton Flats. Uh, Nancy Howell is co-leading the bird walks with another guest leader for most of the Saturdays. Again, COVID restrictions have been dropped, but it is recommended to wear a mask if you're not fully vaccinated. To register, please visit wcaudubon.org and click the Tremont Bird Walks tile on the home page. The next slide, please. All right, so the July virtual field trip. Last month, our virtual field trip was at the Cope Family Reservation in Avon Lake in search of the Easternwood Peewee and Red-Headed Woodpecker. I am currently compiling the bird list, journaling, and photos submitted to me into a digital scrapbook. So if you haven't sent me your items, please get those over to me by end of day Friday, August 6th, that's this Friday. I will then present the scrapbook at our virtual meetup next week on Wednesday, August 11th at 7 p.m. Even if you didn't have a chance to visit the park last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup in which I will share the scrapbook for discussion. Next slide, please. All right, August virtual field trip takes place at the Rookery in Chicago County, uh, where we will be looking for the Eastern Phoebe. Uh, during your visit to the park, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. Take photographs, draw a picture, or create art inspired by what you've seen. Tally identified species or journal your experience. Send your items to me and your contribution will be published to a digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. We will also have an optional virtual meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. Uh, you can get more information and register for this virtual field trip by visiting our website, wcaudubon.org, and clicking the field trips tile on the home page. Next slide, please. All right, the evening bird walks are perfect if you need a nice walk to wind down from the day. And evening is a great time to look and listen for birds as they begin to settle for the night, and for some, just beginning to be active. Uh, evening walks are held on the third Wednesday of each month at 7 p.m. Each walk takes place at a different location, this month we will bird the West Creek Reservation. Uh, please register by clicking the Evening Bird Walks tile on the WC Audubon homepage. Uh, and it looks like Nancy, yeah, Nancy Howell will be our um, leader this month. Uh, next slide, please. 
All right, the Cleveland Metro Parks is hosting a Backyard Nature Bash sponsored by Acme Fresh Food Market in a partnership with Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District and West Creek Conservancy. WCIS is having two bird walks at the event, one scheduled for 12.30 and another scheduled for 2 p.m. on August 14th. Uh, Nancy Howell and Marianne Romito will be leading the walk, so please swing by this fun event and join us for one of the walks. All right, next slide, please. All right, lastly, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Be sure to use hashtag WC Audubon when you post a bird photo on Instagram for a chance to be featured on our Instagram page. If selected, I will reach out to you with details. Also, many of our virtual programs are recorded like this speaker series meeting and our virtual field trips that I mentioned and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel, so please subscribe. All right, and that's it, I believe. Next slide. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks so much, Michelle. Uh, again, so many bird walks, so much fun, uh, great times. And uh, Kurt Miskey, oh, I noticed Kurt just joined the meeting, but uh, Kurt was going to be a little late, so I think I will mention a couple quick things. So next slide, please. I am not Kurt, but Kurt. I will be Kurt for the next slide or two. Next slide, please. All righty. Our updated information on the Bluebird Box project, and of course, we do have to uh, we do have to thank Black River Audubon and their help with us getting the Bluebird boxes up and protected and. Uh, volunteers working and at least one of the boxes has had its second brood uh, of bluebirds. Um, notice that they uh, eggs have hatched or those eggs in the photo have not hatched obviously but uh, August 3rd the eggs have hatched and so again we're bringing more bluebirds into the world which is awesome. Next slide please. I think that's a photo of some of the nestlings. Yes, look at that. Look at those cute little babies all just snuggled in there. It's hard. There are four of them if you can't count one, two, three, four. But uh, this is uh, the, this Bluebird project is really um, it was stimulated by the Jean E. Misty Memorial Fund and we're always uh, asking for donations to help this project. Um, we're ma ma matching the funds one one for one for every dollar up to a five hundred dollars and any funds over five hundred will a certain benefit some other projects in with uh, WCAS so thank you Misty Memorial Fund and the volunteers that have been doing these this awesome bluebird project next please I don't know is Karu going to be talking does anybody know? I did not see her listed on the... No? Nope. All righty. Well, we'll call on and let's see what, what we have here. Peru Savone uh, does our native plant sales and is working very hard with the Tremont Arts and Culture uh, folks and their festival, which will be held Saturday and Sunday, September 18th and 19th, respectively. Uh, both days we will have bird walks for the public starting at 2 and they'll meet at our at the Western Cuyahoga Audubon booth. Uh, we will also be uh, selling native plants. Uh, the plants should be pre-purchased at uh, the WCAS uh, website at the store so that we can have the plants either there for people to pick up or we can deliver the plants as well. So we will hope that you can take a look at, at the website and just see what the variety of plants uh, we'll be offering. Uh, again, provide seed, provide habitat for birds, pollinators, and insects. So it, it, this is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. I'm not sure what the next slide is. Let's see what that is. Oh yes, we need volunteers as usual. Uh, certainly promoting the native plants and soil sale. Soil, you say? Yes, we have partnered with 
uh, Rust Belt Riders, where they take uh, food uh, scraps and waste from restaurants, from people's uh, um, yards that people can sign up, and they make a beautiful, beautiful composted soil product called Tilt Soil. And uh, if you'd like to order some, oops, it says order before July 10th. That's kind of over with. Uh, but you can order uh, on the um, uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon homepage. You see the button right there, the button uh, that you can reach. And we will deliver that as well. So we'll, uh, we're possibly hoping to have some, some soil sales and people picking up that soil. Uh, at the Tremont uh, Arts Festival. Let's go back to the previous slide, please, Betsy. Yeah, order the soil by August 10th. Usually it's the 10th of each month. Previous slide. Yeah, so again, we need people to promote the, the plants and soil sales on social media. Uh, we always need help in delivering plants and then to staff our display and our table at the Tremont Arts Fest. Uh, and the contact is Karu Suboni, but you can certainly uh, contact us at info at uh, We'll all be looking at that site and answer any questions that you may have. Alrighty. Let's move on. We'll go past the soil. And I want to introduce Drina Nemes, who is the chairperson of our book club. Hi, Drina. Hello there, Nancy. Hello, everybody. Next slide, please. Hello, and welcome to looking at what we're going to be reading in the upcoming year. Uh, these are exciting books. Hope that you will be interested and want to join. And also, please take, if you're interested in joining the book club, please take our survey to help with the planning. For example, which might be the best day of the week for you to meet? How much time would you like to spend? And some other survey information that will help us with planning. On a personal note, I'd just like to say that last week I had the opportunity to go to the Roger Torrey Peterson Institute at uh, Lake Chautauqua, near Lake Chautauqua. And uh, it is a beautiful, just gorgeous museum that's curated so beautifully with Roger Torrey Peterson's paintings. They have so many of his paintings, they can't show them all at once. But the connection is, is that they have a, a extensive display and also a variety of media on DDT. And they feature um, some of Rachel Carson's work. So I was uh, interested, very interested in that. And I did buy her book, Silent Spring, while I was there last week. And she and Roger Torrey Peterson um, were contemporaries. And they um, kind of cheered each other on. And uh, they were both great conservationists. And uh, you know, may have, both of them have made such a difference. Uh, and we're reaping the benefits today. So I have to say, this is Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. It's a classic, and I haven't read it yet. But I did uh, buy it, and I'm looking forward to it. And now I have a little bit of history, of uh, just a teeny tiny bit of her history, especially with Roger Torrey Peterson. So if you're interested and would uh, consider taking the book club survey, that will help us with our planning. Um, we are looking at beginning, uh, resuming our book club in October. All righty. Thank you so much, Darina. We appreciate that. And those look like fabulous books. Uh, the Feather Thief, I've read that. I read The Silent, Silent Spring quite a while ago. I need to refresh my memory on that one. And then, Where the World Ends. Ooh, that one sounds kind of ominous. <laughs> so this, this is great. Thank you so much. The next slide, please. And the next person, our digital strategist, Betsy O'Hagan, who has more things to announce.
Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to briefly go over the photography contest, the Guardians of Nature, and the Bird Friendly Coffee. Um, this month's or July's uh, photo contest, this is the winning photograph that was submitted by Roger Friedman. And Roger is here. Uh, Roger, would you like to unmute yourself and say a few words about, introduce yourself and say a few words about the photograph or the camera equipment or anything else you wish? And Roger, you are unmuted, so you should be able just to go ahead and start speaking. Hang on just a moment, everyone. All right, I'm not sure if Roger is still here. Uh, hang on just a minute, please. Uh, the July bird was a killdeer. Okay. All right, Roger is not going to be able to speak at the moment. Um, so, um, hang on just a minute. All right, so this is the winning photograph for the month. And thank you so much, Roger, for entering and sending this beautiful image. Uh, Roger has chosen as a choice of his prize is a one-year uh, Bird Watchers Digest subscription, uh, which is one of the prizes that winners can choose. All right, let's go on. Thank you again, Roger. Uh, the August photograph contest, the bird of the month is the red-winged blackbird, and the contest opens August 1st and closes. Your, everyone is eligible for the yearly contest, and for a choice of prizes. Donations help to support chapter activities. And to learn more about the monthly photograph contest, just simply go to the home page of the website, look for the tile, and pick on the photo contest tile. Thank you. The next slide uh, is about the Guardians of Nature meetings. Uh, this is um, a, a time twice a month that people who are interested in working together on various conservation projects can do so. Uh, there are Thursdays, the third and fourth Thursdays of the month at seven to eight approximately. And currently the projects are the book club programs and survey, uh, the fall native plant sale, a board nomination process, and a digital transformation fund. Um, so do join us if you like. Uh, again, go to the home page of the WC Audubon website and tick there, and you will be um, linked to the registration account. All right, and last but not least, uh, I'd like to remind you that Western Cuyahoga Audubon uh, has a group uh, coffee club uh, where shipping one, once enough um, orders have been reached per month. The shipping uh, fees are bypassed, and um, so do take a look at that. Uh, we ask, like this with the soil orders for the coffee, to please have your orders come in um, by the 10th of the month, and usually um, the birds and beans coffee delivery it takes place within anywhere from two to four days following the order once it goes in. So you do get your coffee order very quickly. Um, and take a look at that. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Betsy. Again, we just have so much happening. Uh, let's toss one more slide down because we're always fundraising. One more slide down, please. There we go. And we are selling uh, gift cards for Mitchell's homemade ice cream. They are in $10 denominations. 
you can order them at the store. You can either have them delivered by hand or by mail. And of course, if you're not a fan of or familiar with Mitchell's ice cream, it's more than ice cream. You can get frozen yogurt, sorbet, vegan ice cream, and uh, you know it's still no, it's always ice cream weather. Not still, it's always ice cream weather. So we hope that you will consider. Uh, again, maybe as a gift for a birthday or uh, an event coming up, um, purchase one of these gift cards. Next slide, please. We'll be getting to our program tonight shortly, but I do want to mention that uh, we will be having our speaker in uh, September, and it's Dr. Sarah Winicki. Oh, actually, she's working on her doctorate. And um, what it's all about is it's pretty much getting your nerd on, your science nerd on. And it's going to be an interactive workshop where participants, those of you who have joined us, are going to hypothesize about the cause of avian migration, gather data about bird bill morphology, the shapes of birds' beaks, diet, and migratory tendencies. And then in the end, uh, participants are going to discuss their findings and uh, have their information analyzed. So it's going to be a really, really fun uh, meeting in, uh, in September, and that will be Tuesday, September 7th. So we hope you can join us, and again, have some friends join us as well. But tonight, and let's go to our next slide, please. Tonight we have Dr. Jim Tomko, who is with the Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland. As a matter of fact, he's the president of the Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland. And his topic, don't touch that nest. Or can you? It's going to be a very interesting thing about eggs, nests, feathers, and some of the rules and laws that were put in place years ago, decades ago, and, you know, can you touch that nest? Can you pick up that feather? So without any further ado, please welcome Dr. Jim Tomko. Well, thank you. Um, you. Can you guys hear me okay? I want to make sure my speaker's working. Okay, good. And Betsy, you got a really gem in Betsy because she spent a long time with me last night getting me up to speed on this particular platform, which I've never used before. And Betsy, you're going to have to remind me, too, how I can start sharing my screen. So I said start sharing. Should I click that button? Yes. Okay. Let's see. Jim, I'm going to send you another presenter invite. Okay. Okay, let's see. Now we're ready? Yes. Hope you don't bring it up. Great. There we go. Hopefully everybody can see that. Looks great. And actually I'm quite surprised that we have almost a dozen people that turned out to listen to this story about some dry old, musty old, 103 old law that doesn't really affect my life at all, or does it? Now we'll come back to that later, but the first thing I want to do is just kind of set the stage of a little, with a little history so that you can better feel what the attitude was concerning wildlife two, three, four, five hundred years ago. And this will deal with a little later the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918. So North America was a time of superabundance. Wildlife beyond anything could ever imagined by most Europeans at the time. Look at all those snow geese. I think we can still see some of that in California. But back in Europe, most people were peasants or serfs of the nobility and they lived on the land of the nobility the lords and the ladies, 
and they could only hunt or fish or harvest trees, fruit, vegetables with permission from the nobleman who owned the land. And these rules were hard and strict and often resulted in hunger and suffering, but if the rules were broken, there were many severe penalties. Then the Industrial Revolution hit, and it was extremely unhealthy conditions for people, both mentally and physically. Then you think about the migration to America by Europeans. And in the late 1500s, 1600s, Europeans began arriving, and they had wide open country, clean air, pure water, and vast, seemingly endless supplies of natural resources, be it plants, trees. Look at those trees. This is what they encountered here. Vast, huge trees. It's amazing. We can't imagine that unless you've been to the redwood forests. And animals. Bisons. Some people call them buffalo. They're not actually buffalo. Those are African and Asian animals, like the Cape buffalo and the water buffalo. These are American bison. There is actually a European bison, too. But bison were estimated at the time Columbus discovered this area to be 30 to 60 million roaming across this country, even into Ohio, even into Pennsylvania. Cardos imagine that kind of thing. There were elk, hundreds of thousands of elk, again, in the east. We only think of them as Rocky Mountains right now. Well, I guess they're reintroducing them into Pennsylvania and Kentucky. But can you imagine seeing fields like that, pastures? We had the passenger pigeon. Not the morning dove, but the passenger pigeon. It's thought that this was, at the time, the most numerous bird on Earth. And even in recent times, probably outnumbered any other living bird. Three to five billion. We'll get back to them a little bit later. There were shorebirds that were hunted for food. And of course, egrets and other colonial nesting waders seem to be decorating every tree in the south. Wild turkey. I think there's an interesting story, and many of you may know this, but when Europeans first landed in Mexico, they came across a domesticated bird, which came from our wild turkey. And they thought, well, this is great. It's a big bird. It grows in the barnyard and lives just fine with humans we're going to take this back to Europe and do the same thing. So they did. And then when the Europeans came back to Massachusetts and Virginia, they brought turkeys with them because they thought this will be a good food source. And they got off the ship and they thought, wait, they're right here already. How'd this happen? So I think that's kind of a cool thing about the turkeys made full circle there. But for over 200 years, European settlers harvested wildlife without any limits. It was how they provided for their families. It was their livelihood. Market hunters were big. They took extreme advantage of the unregulated, unregulated wildlife harvest. I have a few pictures of what market hunters brought in. Can you imagine three men taking all those ducks? Just kind of astounding. And they used any means possible. They had guns that could actually take scores of birds with one shot. So you can imagine how that would devastate a flock. These are bison skulls, folks. So many bison were killed. Oftentimes, for just one part of the animal and the carcass is left to rot. Because they were so numerous, they thought there's a never ending supply. Now, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, there was a great interest in scientific classification of our wildlife, not just here, but all over the world. And no longer was it believed there was spontaneous generation, and expeditions went out to collect and study native creatures. 
to sh share our planet with us. Tom Jefferson was especially interested in this, and he sent out quite a few opposition expeditions. The most famous one, of course, being the Lewis and Clark S expedition in 1804. And here animals were killed preserved and sent back to museums in the East for study and classification. Affluent families actually had their own private bird collections. So where we hang pictures on our wall, they hung birds on their wall. This is not a photograph. This is a, a, a portrait. This is actually, a, you can see a chamber, like a terrarium with preserved birds in it that were decorating people's houses. That's probably the one I could afford if I lived at that time. <laughs> Beautiful, but kind of sad. Feathers were collected too, and there were great um, amounts of people that were studying just the feathers. They are pretty. I bet a lot of you, I bet most of you have a feather collection. But most popular were egg collectors. They would disturb birds' nests, take the eggs out, blow out the contents, and make their own egg collections. This was really a popular pastime. And these are some egg collections that were handed down through generations. The problem is when the nest was disturbed, they often took all the eggs or they made it so obvious where the nest was that predators couldn't then easily kill the rest of the egg, eat the rest of the eggs. Remember, too, that binoculars were not invented until the mid-1800s. So in order to uh, observe birds, you had to either have them in your hand in some manner, usually by shooting them, or if you were wealthy or a pirate, you had a spyglass. But this is the usual instrument that was used to study birds. Now, there's a, one particular crack shot that really could not be beaten. John James Audubon, our namesake, and he shot all the birds that he painted. He shot them. He was one of the first to try to depict them in life. He actually, when he got his bird, he would wire them so they took on kind of a lifelike posture before he painted them. And that's why sometimes you see an odd look to some of his paintings because paper at that time was not so universal as now, and he had to make the bird assume a posture that would fit on his piece of paper. So sometimes like a great blue heron or a sandhill crane, it looks like their head is dipping way down in search of food. But he at least attempted to not waste the resource, and he actually at least tasted or ate many of the birds that he shot. He is known to have said that the taste of the junco is extremely delicate and juicy. And he said American robins were consumed by the thousands by not only him, but people in the area where robins lived. But I love his quote. This is a famous quote. This is one I think this really hits home for many of us. A true conservationist is a man who knows that the world is not given by his fathers, but borrowed from his children. It's kind of remarkable that a man at that time in history, with the abundance that he was seeing, could understand that. Hats were in. At the beginning of this century, hats were in. Today, today hat wearing is not as in style as it used to be, but if you were cool at that time, you had a hat. My dad always wore a hat. Now, that's not my dad. You guys know that. But he did wear a hat until he got to the point where he did not want to dishevel his meticulously positioned coiffure. He actually did what we now affectionately call a comb over. I decided to go the opposite way. <laughs> but um, in the late 19th century, 20th century, hats were the thing. And they were oftentimes decorated with birds. Not just feathers, but birds. Plumes, egrets, and sometimes the whole bird adorned a woman's hat. There's a whole pile of birds on a hat. I don't recognize that bird, but... That's the style. I can't imagine today people going out in public having a dead bird, a preserved dead bird on their hat. 
kind of shocking for us to see that. I think those are some swifts. Some kind of a black-headed gull. You'd think that would be kind of hard to wear, too. Here's the backyard uh, mammal that decorated her hat. This one kills me. <laughs> She's got a nest with eggs and looks like maybe some mallard wings and duck wings on her head. But that was the fashion. Now, you've all heard about the Mad Hatter. I put him up here because these birds were preserved with mercury-containing compounds to prevent their decay and uh, turning back to dust. Well, the, the hatters poisoned themselves with the mercury handling these preserved birds. So when you hear about the Mad Hatter, they really were mad, but it was due to toxicity from the um, preserved birds. And women weren't the only ones. We've all seen these hats in our lifetime with feathers adorning them. Frank Chapman, a very noted ornithologist of the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, he went out on the streets to do a hat birding tour. He found 64 species of birds, all on hats. Pretty remarkable. Of course, you know, he's best known for the idea of the Christmas bird count to replace the traditional side hunt, and that continues to this day. He also was the author of numerous books and published the first, actually the very first pocket field guide. Prior to that, everybody had, had these big bound books that you could not carry in the field with you. It was estimated that between 1866 and 1910, more than 5 million birds per year, that's per year, were taken for the millinery trade. And the heaviest toll was on the Florida's waders. You can sort of see why. I mean, those are pretty fantastic looking plumes. They were actually worth $32 an ounce, which is equal to the price of gold at that time, which is why the motivation was there to take these birds. And some people think that 95% of the population was taken at that time, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Because we all agree, they look a lot better on him than on us. Well, the, some of the plume hunters and local residents started to witness thousands of carcasses and nests and eggs with young, unprotected, succumbing to predators and exposure, and they realized that there were fewer of these around and that the birds were on the edge of extinction. Fortunately, many of these did not go extinct, but I wanted to remind you of some that have gone extinct within our grandparents or even our parents' lifetime, and a couple in I guess I'm getting up there in my lifetime. These are the things that they, the citizens that live nearby watched and their demise. But here's the great auk. It, their family is the northern hemisphere's equivalent to the penguin family. It's not the same family, but they're flightless birds. And because of their flightless, flightless cap they were not capable of flying, they actually were easy prey. Now, they weren't hunted for food because they didn't taste very good. So they were clubbed and cut into fish bait, but their eggs were a prize for the egg collectors. From Labrador Duck. That last one was seen in 1878. They were um, easy hunting because they were northern birds, not accustomed to be hunted with the kinds of weapons that European hunters had, and they fed in sh shallow inlets with easy access. So overhunting is probably the main loss of this beautiful duck. Let's talk a little bit about the passenger pigeon, last one known alive in 1914. Again, the loss of life here was because of market hunting. They were shipped by boxcar loads to the big cities. The chestnut Light, which is one of their main foods, chestnut, and also loss of habitat. So they were considered to be at the three to five billion numbers in its heyday, and Ohio was kind of right in the heart of their area. Today, one of the most numerous birds is red-winged blackbirds, 160 million. These guys, these passengers, 
three to five billion, not million, but billion. Flocks were huge and enormous. Now, when I say a million, I don't even know what that means really. That's too big a number for me to, and then to talk about billion, but just let me talk about a million for a minute. If you stacked 100 single dollar bills on top of each other, a million of those would be a little more than a 35 story building tall. If you stacked or lined up quarters edge to edge, it would be over a mile long. That's a, that's a million. So this 16 inch bird at three to five billion, if you put this 16 inch bird tail tip to head, it would have circled the earth 30 times. Or, another way of thinking, but you went to the moon and back twice. These flocks are so enormous, it's pretty amazing. There were flocks that were sometimes 300 miles long. That means from here to Baltimore, Maryland, or from here to Chicago, and they were a mile wide. The John James Audubon, in him, some of his notes said that when they would fly overhead in those huge flocks, it would be like three consecutive days of living underneath a solar eclipse. So there's Martha. She was last known who died in her aviary at the Cincinnati Zoo in 2014. Carolina parakeet. They were amazingly abundant, but they were deemed an agricultural pest. So their downfall, though, was flock loyalty. The farmers would shoot the birds, and because of their flock loyalty, they would disperse, but they'd immediately come back to hover over their downed comrades, which allowed the farmers to shoot again, and they'd take off, and they'd come back for their downed comrades, and again, they would be shot. So due to agriculture, these birds have been lost. 1932, the last heath hen. And this bird was actually probably the bird served at the first Thanksgiving dinner because it was abundant throughout the coast of the Northeast. It was killed for food, but loss of habitat and pasture land due to fire and farming and grazing was probably its demise. It also was susceptible to poultry diseases, and we won't even get at this, feral cats. Here's one from my era, Eskimo curlew. That bird, last seen 1962, and again, this is overhunting and loss of habitat. It's said that in the 1990s, two million per year were harvested. They must have been pretty tasty, I don't know. And of course, here's one. Maybe in 1944, back in 2006, there was some thought that maybe a ivory belt still exists. I don't know what you guys think, but could be out there. I know when Cuba opened up, everybody was saying, like, oh, maybe there's some in the jungles of Cuba, but I don't know that anybody's actually documented with photograph an ivory build of recent times. But they were big birds, so again, they were used as a food source. Rather, take a big bird than a sparrow to eat. I just want to put these two side by side. I know that the one is your mascot, but a lot of... Um, Hunters are uninitiated to birding might mistake one for the other, although the ivory build is much bigger. And when you see them side by side, they're not that comparable. But if you see them flying away, it could be thought of as, oh, there's an ivory build. So the American Ornithologist Union was developed in the 1800s. It was a group of people that wanted to help start preserving these things, these birds, things. <laughs> Our namesakes. The uncontrolled slaughter was getting clearer and clearer that we were going to lose this resource. And in 1957, a small group of Ohioans, noting the passenger pigeon demise, tried to get a law passed to protect them. It was not ever passed, and it was the reason was because. People in power said that the passenger pins were wonderfully prolific and do not need any help. Florence Bailey was one of the lead activists, ornithologists at the time. And in 1886, the AOU developed something called the Model Law. That was our first bird protection law. But for years they tried in vain to get it passed and never was it accepted. Um, Boston socialite Harriet Hemingway and her 
niece, Mina Hill, with some like-minded friends and guidance from the AOU, established the first Audubon Society. It was the Massachusetts Audubon Society. And to this day, it still is a standalone chapter. Well, it's not a chapter. It's a, a, a Audubon Society. It is not really a chapter of the National Audubon. It's on their own. But they were the first group to expose the fallacy that the plumes on women's hats did not come from naturally molted feathers. They were come, came from birds that were killed. And that's the National Audubon logo, as you see. Wanted to put a real life bird next to the logo. The great egret is who it was modeled after. Now, many states soon formed their own Audubon societies, and they banded together to form the National Audubon Society. But the first affiliating chapter was the St. Louis, Missouri Audubon Society in 1944. Another important gentleman in the early years of trying to control this unwanted slaughter was John Lacey. He was an Iowa congressman, and he got introduced a bill that got passed as the Lacey Act, which forbid the selling of a bird or a part of a bird across state lines. It was the first attempt to control this wholesale slaughter, and market hunters were really affected by that because they could no longer load up boxcar loads of passenger pigeons and send them to New York. You also had a lot to do with the Antiquity Act, which is also known as the Pot Hunters Act. Not that they're looking for pot, but they were looking for pottery. But it was legislation to help preserve plundering of prehistoric artifacts, especially on federal lands. Many of our state, our national parks were started this way through the Antiquity Act. In fact, our, that's, um, the first one was, oh, I'm sorry, was done by U.S. S. Grant in 1872. Now the next slide. Teddy Roosevelt, he was president from 1901 to 1909, and he was an avid birder, an avid hunter, avid angler and hiker, and a great conservationist. He used his powers of the Antiquity Act to appoint this man, Guy Bradley, as the first warden in the Everglades that set off Pelican Island as a protected area for egrets and herons to nest and breed. He also had the unfortunate notoriety of being the first game warden killed in the line of duty. He was a plume hunter, saw the air in his ways, and so he probably was turning in some of his buddies, but he couldn't stand the sight of dying nestlings and went to bat for them. Now he was the first of many wardens at that time that were at their fate because of their protecting the wildlife. Next thing that came up was the Audubon Plumage Act of New York in 1910. And this prohibited the sale of feathers or any part of a bird that was a native wildlife. So we began to start more seriously considering protecting the wildlife. So now we get to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918. It's a long thing to read, but this is the gist of it. It's unlawful to pursue, hunt, take, capture, kill, possess, sell, purchase, or barter, import, export, or transport any migratory bird or any part of this bird, its nest or eggs. It was written in 1916, but adopted by the U.S. and the United Kingdom in 1918. You say, United Kingdom, why are they involved? Well, it's because we are trying to partner with Canada to protect the birds, and at that time, Canada was still under the United Kingdom's authority. Now it also includes Japan, Mexico, and Russia, because some of these birds migrate through those areas too. There are exceptions by special permit from the Secretary of Interior, such as Native American ceremonies where they need eagle feathers. Feathers are very valuable and under strict scrutiny as to who gets them and how many. But you can see that it's part of the culture and 
you can't substitute an eagle feather. So many of these feathers were from molted birds. Other exceptions, I know some of you have uh, worked here before, are for scientific study. And probably you recognize these drawers and recognize this room. This is our own Cleveland Museum of Natural History. You have to have specimens in order to do scientific study. Also exceptions for wildlife rehabilitation. This is Nona Rutgers out in Castalia. She's done a lot to release birds back into the wild and raise them from their young states. So the Migratory Bird Tree Act is divided into three categories. First, we can talk about migratory game birds. And this is what set hunting regulations. So game is by permit only, and it's a season not to exceed three and a half months, which does not include an overlap of the breeding season. Well, you know, a lot of birds move about their territories, so we don't have to just consider migratory game birds, but they also are considering non-migratory game birds, which you recognize these guys. These are under protection. There's some 1,100 birds under protection that are non-migratory game birds. And then we have non-native birds. They deal with that too. Basically, with these two, you may do with whatever you like, without a permit, without penalty. But guys, be, be humane about it. So if you collected a molted feather, we don't know if you collected it molted or got it from the live bird, but if we'll say molted feather, they are sure are pretty. You can hardly help but pick them up. Or an egg. How do we know if the egg was from a nest or from the ground? Or an amazing nest. Nancy, I didn't know that they were expandable with spider. I learned that tonight. That's great. I'm sure some of you have robin's nests or at one time or other picked one up. A beautiful pendular nest of the Baltimore Oriole. So if you ever removed an active nest from your door reef or from your plant, from your deck or patio chair, or from your shed, I tell you, you just broke a federal law and likely some state laws which are punishable by fines of up to $2,000 per incidence and up to two years in jail per offense. So if your feather collection has 10 feathers, hey, that's $20,000 in 20 years in prison if they were to enforce it at the max. This law is important though because it is the law that penalized and forced the restoration of oil spills. Strip mining reclamation Mountaintop removal. I don't know how you can restore a mountaintop, but anyway, I guess they're trying. Leachate from strip mining. Trying to protect um, birds from offshore, near offshore wind farms. In the last administration, there was try a lot of effort trying to change the wording from incidental take which is what's, how it's listed in the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which means the unintentional or accidental but predictable killing of birds, to take it over to a new meaning, meaning intentional take, which means willfully and purposefully killing of birds. Well, I'll tell you, if it was ever changed that way, it does take all the teeth and claws out. Basically, it means that only poachers would break that law. Many industries accept that there's going to be damage to the environment and they're prepared to make restoration. And the Migratory Bird Treaty Act also acknowledges that this is, you are going to have some, some wildlife take, but again, have to be prepared for mitigation or reparation. This is the monies that are got, getting for restoring or rehabilitating oiled birds. So hopefully, if we, we can restore this to its original intent, because if we don't, it would break a 103-year-old law 
a treaty with our northern neighbor, and Canada is particularly especially concerned about this. But hopefully it's going to continue and we'll be able to put those teeth back into the law and keep protecting our birds. So there's hope. I wanted to thank you, and if you have any questions, I don't know if I can answer them, but I'd be willing to try. Thank you so much, Jim. Wow. Um, that's a lot of history, and uh, unfortunately, and too many dead birds. <laughs> um, but, yeah. it's, a, it's a little disturbing. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, but it's good to have those laws in place. I, let me start with a question. I'm sure others may have questions too. So those of you uh, who have, do have a question, you can unmute and and um, you know ask your question. But does the um, migratory bird uh, treaty also include um, Mexico? Uh, or any of the Central or South American countries that it you know? Does include, it does include Mexico, and th I'm not sure if it, the intent, I think, is being visited by some of the Central and South American countries, but I don't think they have signed this treaty. But Mexico has. I guess the reason I'm asking is because, of course, uh, maybe some of you have heard and Jim, I'm sure you're aware of it, that the Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters, COAC, uh, has raised funds for bird ban a bird ban couple of bird banding stations in, um, in Nicaragua. And remember, our migratory birds that are here nesting or go up to Canada, they spend most of their time in the non-breeding season down in that area. So it's, it's important to know uh, where these birds are going to be spending seven months out of the year, you know, here they're only here a couple months. So, so that's good, good information to have. Yeah, yeah we think they're our birds, but yes. they actually spend most of their time someplace else. Exactly. But they put in their yep. best reading plumage for us. <laughs> Any other, anybody else have a question? Well, on a good note, because I mean that was depressing, but on a good note, I hope some of you got to see the piping plovers that are nest had nested over in um, north uh, western Ohio. Uh, is, what was it like, 50 or 60 years? We haven't had a piping plover nest. 83 years. 83. Yeah, it's amazing. And they and they came back this year. That's amazing. So yeah. there's hope. The yeah, things we're doing is, is right. Right, that yeah. and that this Great Lakes population is very, very rare. Uh, so, you know, of course, they do nest on the coast, but the, but this Great Lakes population, so it's pretty special to have four young uh, hatched and raised here, uh, right at mommy at the at the mommy bay resort. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I walk the Sheldon Marsh Nature Preserve regularly, and for the 30 years I've been walking, they've had signs up saying possible nesting piping plovers and I look every year never find them but there's habitat just they got to get enough numbers that so they say we're going to move over here yeah exactly well thank you for having me tonight it was a pleasure and um, hope you guys have some great birding the rest of the season we thank you so very much Mr. Tom or Dr. Tomko appreciate it a lot again a lot of history a lot of good information Thank you so much. Everybody have a good evening and a good rest of the week, good rest of the summer. Please check out the Western Cuyahoga Audubon website since we have so much going on. It's just hard to, to cover it all in such a short amount of time. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.